So it is recording and attendees should start to like come in and there they go. Um, Ken Cade, I think that um, there'll be questions and answers at the little option at the bottom. See a few attendees starting to come in. I uh, just wanted to let you know to hang tight and we will start here in just a few minutes. I think you're muted, Kincaid, sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the Fall 2020 University Community Forum hosted by the Ecumenical Campus Ministries. My name is Kincaid and I help coordinate the forum along with Scott, our ECM administrator and Drew, one of our board members. Um, since this is the second forum of the year, I wanted to welcome everyone who is part of the Lawrence and broader Kansas community, folks from the University of Kansas and friends of the ECM. Also, I see some of my friends in the attendees list, so hi. Uh, to give you an idea of how this virtual forum will work, the format we will be following is 40 minutes of speaker time 
followed by the remaining time dedicated for questions and answers. We have also elected a core group of ECM affiliated folks to be able to turn their video on to make this as close to a live seminar experience as possible. If you have any questions for Sam, Allison, Natale, please reserve them until the Q&A session at the very end and please keep yourselves muted. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanted to briefly say a few words about the forum um, and the ECM. Uh, the University Community Forum has been bringing together the KU and Lawrence community since the 1940s. This program hosts, oh, this program hosts presentations by faculty, students, and community members to educate and facilitate dialogue on current ideas and events that shape our world and discourse. Um, if you are just thrilled by this forum and want to join us next time, our next forum is going to be December 15th, 6.30, right here on Zoom. We are going to have uh, Chris Lazaro, um, who will be talking about faith as it relates to uh, urban planning, is recently written a book called Faith in Cities. Um, I also want to take this time to mention that the ECM is a nonprofit organization that survives off of your generous donations. Um, so check out e ecmku.org. Uh, to see other programming that you can get involved with or check out ecmku.org slash donate to give us a few dollars. So finally, I will introduce our speaker, Sam Allison Natale. Uh, Sam is a criminal defense attorney living in Kansas. Uh, before moving to the Midwest, he served as a public defender with the Bronx Defenders. He currently organizes with the Lawrence, Kansas chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. And also importantly, he's my friend. So I'm thrilled to be sharing this space with him and with all of you tonight. And so now I will stop talking and turn it over to Sam. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Oh, hey y'all. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, be here. And thanks again to Kincaid and the ECM for inviting me. Uh, definitely nervous because this is a subject that's like really, really important to me. Um, and that I don't think I've ever like just talked about in a full on sort of general way. So really excited uh, to do that with y'all. Um, so I'm going to get to some sort of goals um, and definitions to sort of ground our conversation. But before um, we did that, I wanted to go to um, something that I think is a really good uh encapsulization of what I mean when I'm talking about uh, religious socialism and religion and socialism. Um, this is a piece I really liked um, called A Prayer for Oscar Romero. Uh, Oscar Romero was um, an El Salvadorian archbishop uh, who was assassinated by right-wing paramilitary forces backed by the United States government uh, for um, speaking out against the uh, right-wing military government there. Um, and uh, being using his power and his position to advocate and more importantly organize for changes in the economic lives um, of working class people in El Salvador. Um, and so I wanted to share uh, this prayer um, that some other priests put together um, to commemorate his death. It helps now and then to take, to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. That is what we are about. We plant a seed that will one day grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. 
and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Um, and what I like about this and what I think um, encapsulates the ideas of religion and socialism being intertwined is that I think that both Oscar Romero's faith and um, his economic understanding gave him a perspective on his work in the world and the work that needed to be done that would not have been complete with only one of these things. Um, uh, my good friend, Sam Brody, uh, who I was talking to about this uh, talk earlier today, uh, sent me a piece by um, Martin Buber, which is a three theses on religious socialism. Um, and in it, he describes um, religion, it says that religion uh, without socialism is a soul without a body. And socialism without religion is a body without a soul. Um, although he does draw the distinction that at least if you've got a body and no soul, uh, you may be following the call of God. Um, whereas if you are solely disembodied and believing in principles that you don't act upon, um, then you're really missing something important. Um, and so he ultimately sides with the heavy emphasis on the socialism and religion. Um, but I'm going to come at this from a different perspective because um, I have um, some different ideas about what um, our audience is here. So I want to sort of ground this um, in a few understandings. So I'm gonna start out with some premise and definitions that guide us. Um, I wanna talk about what connects religion and socialism um, and that it's gonna be that both are about transformation that ultimately um, these are both logics of how we transform ourselves and our world and also understandings about how we intersect with those struggles to change those things. Um, and I'm going to try and do the following. If you are a, uh, a socialist and you are not religious, I want to uh, convince you that you should take up some sort of spiritual practice. Um, and if you are religious um, in any way, shape or form, I'm gonna try and convince you that you should be a socialist and that you should actually organize uh, for a better world with others um, in a socialist uh, organization or a labor organization. Um, and then I wanna just sort of open up that floor for, for discussion and questions about what folks think. Um, can folks shoot, do we have like a chat function where folks can tell us which one of these that they are, if you are a religious socialist, if you are religious, but not a socialist, and if you are a socialist, but not religious. Um, Kincaid, I don't know if you can make that happen or. Yeah, we do I have, oh, sorry. You go, oh, Jay. I was just gonna say, would you like that in the form of a poll or just- Yeah, let's do a poll. Let's throw a okay. poll. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are, what are my options here? Um, if you are, uh, both religious and a socialist. Um, if you are religious but not a socialist, but or or maybe maybe you're just socialist curious. That's also fine. Um, if you're a socialist but not religious, and if you are neither, I suppose would be the four options. Um, and while that poll is getting put together, I wanna to like say some premises and caveats. So first of all, I have to acknowledge that I'm gonna be talking about like religion, right? Um, and in doing so, I can really only talk about, because I'm not a scholar of religions, I can really only talk about my faith uh, and how um, 
you know, how that affects me. Um, and at the same time, I don't want to leave everybody out, right? I don't want to be like, this is a talk about Christianity, right? So I'm faced with a conundrum of I can either uh, only talk about Christianity and talk about my faith at the risk of being exclusionary, or I can try to be inclusive and use universal terms like spiritual practice and, uh, and religion, knowing that some things that I might assume to be universal about spirituality might actually just be a reflection of mine. And so I'm opting to take the second route here where I uh, will talk about spirituality, religion, and faith as sort of interchangeably um, and talk about these things as having certain qualities. But if that's not true of your experience or of some other religion you know about, please just extend me the grace that I'm not trying to erase anybody um, I'm really speaking from my own experience, but trying to make it, you know, like as open to others as I can. And if I, if I slip up, definitely feel free to, to correct me. Um, cause I think that's just going to happen. Um, so, um, the other premises that I have, um, and these are going to be some hot takes, but they're sort of where I'm coming from is I think that in general, um, we don't live in a time of very strong spiritual beliefs. So I think um, some people um, are, um, so some people are, um, you know, atheists, right? But very few people are probably what we would call somebody who is a committed to the belief that there is no God and that there is no underlying truth of the world, right? Um, that I think most people don't believe simply because they don't really believe very strongly any spiritual ideas, not necessarily because they are convinced of, um, of uh, any particular account of like a hard atheism. And I'd say this is probably true of most religious and spiritual people as well. Like there's a lot of Christians for instance, who have uh, been sort of acculturated to that, but probably don't really believe very deeply or think very hard and certainly don't live that out in their lived experience, right? And I think that this is a feature of, uh, of liberalism or neoliberal capitalism um, that has sort of stripped out um, by creating alienation, which we'll talk about later, right? Um, our connections to each other and, and sort of stripped away the foundations of the type of society that uh, made really strong belief even possible in the first place or at least easier. Um, so uh, my starting premise is that like most people really aren't that deeply committed uh, whether they are a believer or a non-believer. Um, that um, liberal individualism, and again, we'll talk more about what this means, is a, is a problem um, that this framework of an obsession, oh, not obsession, a primary interest in one's own ideas and one's own personally held uh, decisions um, as an individual. Uh, I think of this as, uh, you know, rather than being beholden to a collective will, which we think of as sort of scary and bad, more like a fandom, right? Where I may be in relation to others by my personal consumption choices, but I'm not actually engaged in the co-creation of this thing that we're sort of nominally sharing together, right? Um, we'll talk more about that later, but that's gonna be a sort of big premise here. Um, the other important premise is that I'm gonna be talking about ethics and I think there's really three main ways to think about ethics. And I'm not going to go super deep into this, so just take my word on it. Um, but there is utilitarianism, right, which I think is people's default view of ethics under capitalism. And this is one where it's all about just calculating what the best thing to do is, right? Like what this is your sort of classic trolley problem of there's a trolley that can proceed down two tracks and it's gonna squish more people on this one. So you pull the lever and send it down to the other side, right? Um, I think a lot of people when they think of ethics just think about doing the most good um, in terms of outcomes. Um, and then there's a second kind of ethics which is about rule following. This is called deontological ethics. And it's 
not about what is, you know, the best outcome, right? But um, that there are certain things that you should just never do. Like you should never lie, you should never steal, um, and you just follow the rules. Um, and these are both pretty conventional forms of ethics. And I don't follow those. Um, and I don't think that y'all should either because I really believe in what's called virtue ethics where ethics is not just about uh, adhering to a rule or about external outcomes, but it's about building up through your whole person character that allows you to actually be good. We become good people by practicing being good and doing good things, but not just doing good things, but also thinking good things, right? Um, doing those good things for the right reason um, and developing those into a habit. The, the shortest thing is basically that we get good at what we practice and virtue ethics is not about just making a decision to be a different kind of person or hold a different kind of idea. It's about actually practicing these things and transforming over time. Um, and so the upshot of all of this is that like, yes, I'm trying to uh, make a distinction here about like um, what beliefs we should have, but those beliefs aren't really the most important thing to me because I think that an individual believing, oh, I am a revolutionary socialist now. Sure you are, that's great. Now do enter a community of practice and actually struggle to, uh, to make the world a better place, right? Um, somebody could have an individual belief, um, you know, about God. Um, but I think that if you actually want to transform your relationship to uh, the, the world, you have to do that in a community of practice somehow, right? Um, whether that's a church, whether that's a friend group, whether that's just, uh, you know, seriously engaging with other people who um, are asking similar questions to you. Um, it all comes about through communal practice. So I'm not thinking that anyone at the end of this is just going to like totally be transformed by the things I want to say. But I do think if you're interested in what I'm saying or where I'm going, um, then you should at least take a step towards uh, trying to develop this as a shared practice in a community. So um, what, what are we talking about here? Okay, so when we say socialism, right, we have to understand uh, that we're talking about this on the background of the way the world is, which is um, in the United States, what we would call racial capitalism, right? Racial capitalism is a source of massive uh, inequality. Um, and this is very much um, by design. So capitalism is an economic and political system in which trade and industry are controlled by private owners and goods or services are brought, bought and sold for a profit. And um, we sort of take this for granted as it's always been the way that it is, but it's not. Um, this is a specific historical development that happened because people were able to accumulate capital, like accumulate a bunch of stuff by taking things from others. This happened in a few different ways through colonization, uh, through displacement of Native Americans, through slavery, through the closing of the commons. But first a bunch of people stole uh, a, a lot of capital and then turn and then grew that capital by buying other people's labor and, uh, and using the other people's labor to generate a profit. So the means of production, right? The technology, the resources, the machinery that we use to produce those goods and services are privately owned and they're monopolized by a small class of people. And those people are protected by the state. Um, they get legal rights to do this. Um, and if you you know, if you don't comply, the state will discipline you. If you don't pay your rent, you'll be evicted, right? Our work, right, if you work for a wage because you need that to survive, um, then you are probably a member of the working class. And our work is exploited by the boss. We as workers sell our labor for wages and the money that you get is less than the value that you produce because if you got all of the value that you produced in a day's work, your boss wouldn't get any profit. So you're always getting shortchanged. 
um, and capitalism relies on and perpetuates patriarchy and white supremacy, right? So the initial seizures that went into creating that initial capital, right, comes out of um, slavery, but it also comes out of um, creating gender divisions in labor that uh, then um, basically forced women to do lots of work for no wages at all. Um, and also it creates these separations through race and gender and other separations create social hierarchies between groups of people. And that makes those people easier to exploit. Um, and it makes it harder for workers to unite. Um, and we like have seen this across history, right? So that's where we're at. That's the world that we're at right now um, and sort of an important place to come from. Um, when we're thinking about what's our relationship to the world, because again, that's a question that sort of religion asks as well. Um, okay, so what is democratic socialism? The democratic socialism is an alternative to racial capitalism in which rather than the means of production being owned by private owners, they would be owned collectively by all of us in the community. It would be controlled democratically, right? Uh, by the people who actually do the work and the people who are, um, you know, actually most affected by the decisions um, about how the stuff is produced. And then that stuff that gets produced, everyone would have a social right to it, especially the things that you need most, like housing, education, healthcare. These things would no longer be uh, commodified or sold for profit. Um, they would just be made available to people as a matter of right. Um, and this has really important uh, aspects for spirituality, which we'll also talk about, right? Um, that ultimately we can think of capitalism as a kind of fallen state, right? In that we are cut off from our work. We are cut off from each other. We no longer have the ability to make decisions about how we spend our time or our lives or who we spend it with because we have to work for a boss who dictates the conditions that we live in for eight hours a day and then uh, have to continue to try and just subsist um, for the rest of that time so we to be our sort of most like fully human selves, right? Um, and under democratic socialism, we can see a system in which we would be able to, because everybody would have the basics that they need to survive, because everybody would have a role in the decision making about how we live our lives and spend our time and what we make. Um, we would be in deeper connection with one another through our dis democratic decision making, that we would be sort of more fully human uh, in this system in which we are currently deprived of our humanity. Um, so some other really important definitions, right? Um, so just touching briefly on these, alienation is what Marx thought of, and a lot of this is coming out of Karl Marx, right? One really important theorist about uh, socialism, that people are alienated, that is separated in a whole bunch of different ways. We're separated from our labor because what we do with our time when we're at work, we don't get to decide. We don't get to keep the stuff that we make, right? Um, and so we are separated from what we spend most of our time doing. We're separated from each other because we're cut off through all of these fake um, social divisions. Um, and so we are cut off from ourselves and from our society uh, in a really important way. Liberalism, right? Um, is the default ideology of uh, our society. This is a, it comes out of the enlightenment um, and it is primarily concerned as we said with individual decisions um, and individual um, actions as opposed to collective actions. Um, there and with a high uh, premium pay, placed on the privacy of one's decisions and that private property. Um, and when I say private property, I don't mean personal property. I don't mean a thing like your toothbrush or your cell phone um, or your laptop. I mean, specifically the things that are necessary to make stuff, right? Like the factories and the telephone lines and the internet, right? Um, that is private property because it's held privately. 
Um, and so uh, we live in a society that really values that very same alienation and separation um, and cutting off um, uh, of all the means of production, how we live our lives. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about organizing and organizing is just that we come together to solve a problem collectively. Um, and uh, that we do this through um, creating, it, often through having to fight with the capitalist class to get something that we need or want, right? Um, and what's kind of interesting is that the process of changing the world was for Marx part of where he got some of the ideas about what a democratic socialist society could look like. The ways that people treated each other, they were in groups of workers came together to struggle against the bosses for a better world. The way that they organized democratically, um, the solidarity and community that came out of that act of struggling was what he thought should also be that, that was people at our highest selves, right? That was what we should strive to be in a better world. Um, so um, with some of those definitions out of the way, I wanna talk about uh, the first sort of piece of this, which is if you are, what, what, is, what is the overlap between religion and socialism? Um, and, and what's the connection here? And I think in the case of Christianity, it's pretty clear. And so I'm taking some of this from the Institute for Christian Socialism. Uh, which lays out, right, like a scriptural understanding uh, of the basis for socialism. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a cliche that like Jesus was a socialist, but that's also just true. Um, so, um, so Jesus, uh, his ministry began with an announcement of good news to the poor and calling for the release of captives, the liberation of the oppressed, the forgiveness of financial debts, and the redistribution of wealth, right? So right away, we're not just talking about individual decisions about being nicer to other people, although that's certainly an important thing, and I'm not gonna downplay that, but rather that there is like a collective action that needed to be taken to make the world better. Um, he warned against making money as a god um, and taught that the highest law is the love of God and neighbor. And that's something that we're also gonna hopefully touch on, but that right now under capitalism, even though people have become less spiritual in a lot of ways, what has arisen is a sort of faith in markets and a sort of idolatry for money as a God uh, that I think that at a minimum, we should get away from that and into actually um, believe in a real higher power. Um, Jesus called workers, social agitators, and outcasts to follow him in healing the sick, comforting the aggrieved, feeding the hungry, and seeking a just new society of mutual service. Um, his meal practices leveled social hierarchies. No one should fear having their needs go unmet because of the same measure of abandon with which you give aid, he said, is the same measure you'll receive, right? So uh, you should not have to hoard things, right? Because from each according to his need, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, right? Um, whatever you, we all give and we all pay into the system and we all receive out of it too as we need. Um, he condemned the religious and political elite who elevated themselves by burdening others and engaged in direct action to dismantle the systems of exploitation. Like this is Jesus and the money changers turning the tables upside down. That's what we're called to do, right? So at least in Christianity, um, there's a really strong, really clear uh, foundation. And if you thought that this, uh, that I'm soft peddling this, uh, I just want to turn to one of my favorite pieces, which is James, who goes so fucking hard <laughs> for <laughs> religious socialism. Um, this is chapter five, verses one through six. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. 
You have fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So like, look, if it seems, if I'm saying, if I'm extreme for saying that Christians should fight for free healthcare, right? Like take it up with James, right? Um, and, you know, like elsewhere, you know, like John the Baptist says, if you have two coats and your neighbor has none, you're going into the fire. So give them your coat, share your coats, right? Is sort of the bottom line of the Bible in, in these parts. Um, and so, um, but this is, this is a real thing, right? If um, that Christianity and I'd say other faiths are also, can, are all interested in these fundamental questions that we also said are fundamental questions for socialists, right? What is our relationship to each other and to the world? Um, what does it take to live a good life and be a good person? And what material things stop us from being able to do that, right? Um, what are we called to do and how are we called to transform ourselves and our world to be able to live up to these ideals? Um, and we see, in fact, um, that there are lots of religious people who have become socialists because they believe that that was the right thing to do. Um, and um, I want to talk about a few of them, um, there, but there's like so many. There's really like no end here. Um, but I, uh, in particular, um, Martin Luther King, uh, South American liberation theologians and priests, so Oscar Romero, Gustavo Gutierrez, um, there's, I have this awesome book, which I'll show you here, um, A Black Theology of Liberation, uh, by James Cone. Um, we have, um, the original theology of liberation, Marxism and Christianity. Um, we have lots and lots of thinkers who are, uh, religious socialists. Um, but why, right? Like, why do this? Um, so the reason why folks like Baird Rustin and MLK um, embrace democratic socialism, and, and at a time that it was so dangerous to do so, right? Like MLK was being harassed and wiretapped by the FBI at all times. And if he got within 10 feet of communism at all, like uh, they could have ruined him. And nonetheless, he could not help but come to the conclusion that a mass working class multiracial um, attempt to change our economic system was what was necessary to make good on a world that was based on human dignity, right? Um, and I'd say that you need socialism for this and not just some generalized desire to do good because it's only by understanding the economic basis of, um, of how racism operates, right? Of how injustice operates that we can dismantle it, right? So uh, a great example of this is the March on Washington, everybody remembers, but what people forget is that it was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, right? It was a march for jobs. One of the key demands was a federal jobs guarantee. The same thing that we're also demanding now uh, for like the Green New Deal, right, um, was at the heart of this work. And without understanding that there is a class struggle that is involved, you might not for instance, understand the importance of the labor movement, right? That it is only by organizing working class people as a class and striking to withhold our labor that we ultimately have leverage um, over the system that caused Baird Rustin, a dedicated Quaker to commit his life to, um, to the labor movement um, and uh, through uh, raising up uh, more black workers into the, the trades unions, how he spent the last part of his life. Um, so we need an organization, a program to make good on these things that are coming to us from scripture, right? Um, because you can't do it alone, right? 
um, it is only through a mass multiracial working class movement can, can things change. So if you're religious, then I would say you should try socialism. This one's easy, right? Um, so let's go to the harder one. Um, now I saw in the poll that we have, um, did I lose the poll? Did I lose the poll? Hold on. I, need to, I, I can read the results if you'd like. Oh yeah, go ahead and read the results. That'd be right. great. Well, you'll be happy. Religious and socialist is the, the preference of the majority of people. 12 people said that. Uh, religious, not socialist is five people. Socialist, not religious is five people. And neither socialist nor religious is three people. Okay, awesome. All right, so we've got a good, a good balance here. Okay, so if you're one of my five people who's a socialist, but not religious, um, I'm going to try and sell you on why uh, you should combine this, right? Why you should have some kind of spiritual practice. And all I'm trying, all I'm really interested in here is um, two aspects of belief, right? Um, not necessarily Jesus, right? But just two aspects of belief. If you believe that goodness is real and that everything that you do sort of matters to that goodness, I would say, that you are 90% uh, of the way there, right? Um, for me personally, right, in my journey to becoming spiritual, the biggest difference was going from believing that the world was a cold and nonsensical place that had, uh, and that, you know, all of this stuff like goodness and justice were just human terms that we came up with, um, and coming to realize that they have an independent reality that they're real the way that numbers are real, right? They're abstract, but they're real. Um, and you can identify them. Um, and um, I would say that this is something that comes across when you're doing good work. Like if you're doing mutual aid work, the goodness of what you're doing just hits you in the face. Uh, that when you, when you engage in direct service to another person, um, it's not just that it feels good, it's just that you realize that what is doing, what you're doing is what we ought to be doing for each other um, in a way that is just palpable. Um, and I would say that the that um, this the belief in the reality of these things is a really important bedrock for action um, and also to make sure that you don't fall into the sort of capitalist ide idolatry of like a worship of a market or the worship of the way things are um, because you have an anchor to something that is real and outside um, of that system. It's not just a matter of opinion when we say that everybody deserves housing. Right, I believe that is a fact. I believe that it is a fact that people should not be tortured uh, so that like Raytheon can make more profits in the Middle East, right? That's not an opinion. That is <laughs> that, uh, that the opposite of that, right? What they're saying is that, you know, uh, that this is a good thing, that is a lie. So I'd say that um, believing, why, so why should we believe in truth and why should we believe in goodness? Um, so one is I think it is an important uh, basis for your continued action. It sustains you when things are hard. But two, I would say that if you, many times we act as if this is already true, right? Um, like we certainly act like justice is real when we all go out into the streets demanding it, right? Um, it's a weird thing to say that like it's unjust uh, that, like folks of color are killed by the police and then turn around and say that, well, justice isn't really real. It's just a thing we made up. Um, so I'd say that it's a question of being consistent, um, but it's also a question of truth that like in science, I might not be able to, I've never seen an atom. I've never seen a particle. I believe that the world is made of atoms because when I act as if that is true, I'm able to predict things about the world. I'm able to, uh, to conduct experiments and get results that I want, right? And I'd say if you act as though justice is real and that goodness is real um, and it works out for you, that's a sign that actually it might deep down actually be that way. And you'll never get to know. No one will ever get to know till the end of time we won't ever know. But 
um, I would say that it's a justifiable belief um, that these things are real because once you've already begun working to dedicate yourself to these things, it just makes sense to believe in them as being real. The second thing is um, that I'm interested in as a part of spirituality is simply that everything matters. What I mean by everything matters, I mean that your internal world matters to being a good person that it is not solely a matter of just being externally good and doing good things in the world, but how you think and your internal practices really matters. And we're in a part, we're in a place in the world right now, right? Where um, we say impact matters, not intent. I definitely believe that that's true insofar as you're talking about like harm that you might have done to another person, right? Um, but I do think intent does matter, that it's not just that we do good things, but that we do them for the right reasons. We do them because they are good, because we believe in them. Um, and so having paying some attention to your internal life, how you think about things and uh, how you orient yourself to goodness, right? How you orient yourself to justice. Um, one nice thing I like about church, it's just a place that we go together to think about justice collectively every week right? Having some orientation to um, these things internally really matters. Um, and uh, Emergent Strategy, a phenomenal book by Adrienne Marie Brown um, about organizing about a ton of different things. Um, she talks about how spiritual practice is a really important piece of resiliency for organizers because this work is really hard. Um, and um, I think that if you're going to have some kind of faith, right, as a socialist, um, the alternatives of sort of remaining undecided or I think worse being a scientistic, right? Having this um, belief that Marx solely, Marx represents a scientific foundation uh, on which the future of the world is certain ahead of time because of necessary laws of history um, is a bad basis for, for faith um, for lots of reasons, one, because it, the, the predictions didn't all pan out, um, but also because um, it, uh, again, is that type of individualistic um, approach that is totally ungrounded from a community of practice. Um, so um, yeah, just before we go to the, the Q&A, um, I think that, yeah, these two things are ultimately deeply, deeply uh, intertwined and interrelated and strengthen one another um, and that they um, that I if we are serious about the business of transforming ourselves or if we're serious the business about transforming the world if you're a socialist you have to be seriously in the business of transforming yourself um, and transforming your relationship to the world right in whatever form that that might take um, and if you're serious about uh, being transformed um, by God and by your faith, um, if you're a religious person, then you should be serious about transforming the world. Because if you believe that everyone needs access to material preconditions to have a good and just life, um, then you need to take on the forces that are making that impossible. That is capitalism um, through a, a collective struggle with other people. Um, so yeah, let's let's do the open up the Q and A. I have a question. Um, you, you looked at a lot of Christian texts for a justification for uh, socialism. Have you explored other religious texts for a justification for socialism? Yes. Well, okay, yes and no. Um, so I think um, in some way, so this book, Virtue and Politics, um, Alistair McIntyre, um, comes at it from an Aristotelian, so like Aristotle, pre-Christian, um, philosophical basis. Um, there is a rich tradition of Jewish socialism, um, although I have not done the readings on that. Um, my man Sam Brody can tell you a lot more about that. Um, and um, so I have not done the reading to, uh, to be familiar with this, although I know that it 
does exist in other traditions. And I have lots of comrades um, of other faiths who tell me that their faith, um, like uh, Muslim or Buddhist has really informed um, socialism and their practice as an organizer. Um, but I'm not familiar enough of, with those traditions to speak confidently about them. Great, thank you. Um, I was gonna say if anyone else has questions, um, I can allow you to talk uh, by clicking your name. So just uh, ask to talk. Okay, I think we've got a couple hands. Let's start with Robert Trout. Hey, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Hey, I see you. Hi, Robert. Hey, good to see you, Kincaid. Um, so my question is, I'd like to um, ask on the religious side. Um, I'm one of the ones who's religious, but a little on the, the line about socialism, um, especially to the degree with which you've presented it. But I wanted to ask, you brought up several, several scriptures um, from the Institute for Christian Socialism. So I'd like to compare those to um, Paul's contentment that he mentions in Philippians 4, uh, 11 through 13. Um, if you don't mind, I could read it to you just for everybody else, unless just have everybody Google it. Um, Paul is responding to um, the Philippians and the accusations that, you know, he's been taking money from them. And uh, his response goes on for a bit, but he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content, uh, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. So I'm curious with, you know, this scripture like that, um, what's your response? So, okay, there's a couple things that are happening here. So this is part of um, Christianity um, that comes out of uh, the you know, the, he's speaking to uh, a Greek audience coming out of the Stoic philosophy um, that um, was, that itself came out of um, a orientation to really tough times, right? So the Stoic philosophers were all about, um, and there's a strong element of this in Christianity, about being, um, cultivating an internal uh, peace that allows you to withstand things like, um, and this is something like that comes across really hard in AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, in which um, there is a very strong premium placed on being undeterred, uh, un, unmoved um, by, uh, by external tragedy, right? Being able to withstand things. Um, and I think that um, in my experience of sort of direct service, right, like this can be a really useful thing, right? Um, being able to be content in really hard times um, is really, really useful. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the converse of this, right, if, we're, if we use the AA framework to uh, the wisdom, well, the, um, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to uh, change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And so there may be circumstances in which as an individual or even as a group, we are unable to change um, the hardships that we're in. I think this is definitely true of climate change, right? Like if we're lucky enough to get socialism and survive, we're gonna have really hard times and scarcity in a lot of ways, right? Um, and, um, and so we might have to adapt ourselves to that contentment, but at the same time, we are still called by God to change the things that we can. And through collective action, we have quite a bit to do with that, right? So I don't see these two things as being uh, in conflict with each other, right? I think that they are different levels of abstraction for dealing with individual tragedy, right? Or even some level of collective tragedy that is unavoidable um, and still having the affirmative need to go out and change things to avert that catastrophe for others in so far as we're able to. Um, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. 
Um, it looks like we've got a question from Joey Hensler in the chat. Um, so he says, or is this just a comment? I'm sorry. I think it's just a comment. Okay, let's go to Sasha Ortega. It's Arteaga, but thank you. Um, yeah, I really appreciated um, this talk. I um, I just had some comments, and I think a lot of them ha uh, have to do with like examining your specific positionality here. Um, like I'm assuming, um, I I felt that this was um, not a very intersectional approach to this. Like obviously, if you're if you're just trying to keep it like to like Christianity, that that's one thing. Um, however, like when you started this out, you're like, you said that this had to do with um, all like, you should be like religious as in like anything, any spirituality, and then all your case studies had to do with um, Christian thinkers. Um, so if we're going, um, if we're thinking about this, and you did mention a little bit about the um, ideas of like the race based colonial uh, capitalist system. However, if we're looking at Anibal Quijano and um, Walter Mignolo's ideas of coloniality of power, that also is based off of um, like rate that's, you know, it's heavily based off of race and it's heavily based off of sex and um, like the tools of religion to oppress. Um, and also, if we're going, you know, to like Aristotelian and Pla Platonic um, philosophy, we're thinking about. Um, you know, who, who's a valid ruler and like by those, by that, then everybody who came post contact doesn't have any valid rules. So in that sense, if we're on stolen land, then how, like, no matter how religious or how socialist or the combination of the two that we are, we're still not, um, we, that, that doesn't matter because we're, we're on, we're, we're not on our own land. Um, so I, I'm wondering how um, that affects this approach because, um, you know, obviously there is a strong tradition of uh, liberation theology in the global South. However, that's still Christian informed. Um, so that's basically my comments I had on that. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I think I tried to incorporate as much as the areas that I'm familiar with to um, to bring in, because uh, I agree very much that um, the intersectional voices, well, the intersectionality of racial capitalism um, requires us, and also of gender-based violence um, that is part of that system, like requires us to sort of center that um, in our thinking. Um, and that's why, yeah, um, I've tried to highlight um, the areas of this sort of uh, struggle in the context of Black liberation um, and of anti-colonialism um, in Latin America. Um, in terms of the question of like, how does this intersect with the, with uh, the ongoing need for decolonization. Um, I think that the Red Nation, um, which is um, a socialist organization of uh, indigenous people, um, uh, Nick Estes is a really uh, is a big proponent of them. Lays out, um, you know, a revolutionary socialist position on decolonization, which I think. Um, one thing that I really like about Marx, and I think that they identify in that as well, is that it takes us from the dirt of what is, right, the mess that we're in, and identifies within it the contradictions that can lead us out into uh, something better. And so I think even for um, undoing uh, the horrible history of colonialism and racism, a mass multiracial working class movement um, is I still think the only way to have enough power to take on the white supremacist capitalist class. Um, and so, and that was, you know, like, 
um, King and Bayard Rustin's conclusions um, as well um, and why they oriented themselves to, um, to the religious socialism in the way that they did um, was because it's only out of, um, the only way to have enough power, the only way to have enough numbers um, to undo this is through um, a working class movement. Um, um, and so, yeah, I hope that that answers your question. And I also, I wanted to touch on something that you touched on that was similar to something that Joey said in the chat, which is like, all right, yeah, like how is the church uh, like upheld capitalism? Abs absolutely, that is like absolutely the case, right? Like that the, um, that the institutions of religion um, have like since capitalism and probably for quite a long time before, right? Like been a tool of the powerful. Um, and I think this is one of those contradictions that we, that Marx identifies, right? So like Marx says, yes, like um, religion is the opiate of the masses, but that's not the whole quote. The whole quote is, it is the heart of a heartless world. It is the sigh of the oppressed. And so within religion, it's not just a way um, that Marx believed and what Marx believes is like not the center of the story it doesn't have to be the most important thing we pay attention to, right? But I think it's instructive as like a counterexample um, that um, this is not just a, um, a thing that upholds power, right? But within that as well, because of these kernels uh, of liberation, because of the communities that it creates that can be and have been organized um, for greater justice, um, that um, it is still an important place for us to go uh, to, um, to incorporate into the struggle, right? Um, and like unions too are sometimes not always uh, the best, right? Like there are definitely unions that do shitty things, right? And yet unions um, are still the best shot that we have uh, for uh, creating working class power, right? Um, and so these things where, where the institutions sort of like fail us, I see as an invitation um, to um, to find within them and to develop those contradictions um, into a way out. Does that answer? I hope that answers your question, Joey. Um, Kincaid, how much more time do I have? I've got like two more questions here. Yeah, we are running a little short on time, but there was one from Julian Zier that I definitely wanted to get to. Um, and if there's another one on there that you that you specifically want to answer, Sam, don't let oh me. Oh my God. Yes, okay, I'm gonna read this out loud. Um, I love what you said about the commitment to transforming the world requiring commitment to transform ourselves and the intention to place religious freedom and pluralism as part of the democratic socialist project. How can I get involved in this conversation within the DSA? I'm a black, queer, Dharma practitioner, teacher, and would love to talk about race, Dharma, and socialism. Okay, this is great. Um, if you want to get involved with DSA, um, there is, um, so you can join DSA at dsausa.org slash join the Democratic Socialist of America for folks that don't know, um, the largest democratic socialist organization in the country. It's one that I participate in. Uh, in Lawrence, um, Hannah, my lovely wife is- Oh, I was just gonna say, Hi, Julian. I think Julian's already in DSA. Oh, um, you're already in, but- So for religious socialism. Oh, but know. there is a religious uh, religious socialist working group um, that uh, meets online. They have a huge number of um, events that you can check out. Um, but if you just Google the, religious so the religion and socialism working group, um, you can find them. Um, or definitely reach out to me and I can connect you to folks. Um, but yeah, they're having the National Religion and Socialism Working Group is having like, I think almost weekly calls now on various topics um, that has a much broader range of faith than I've been able to present here. Um, that would be a really great place to talk about this within DSA. And I feel like letting you plug DSA is a good place to kind of wrap this up. 
Um, I want to thank Robert, Sasha, Julian, Lisa, and Joey for your questions and contribution to the conversation. Um, at least half of you, I miss you, I love you. I hope you're doing well out in the world right now. Um, I want to thank all of our attendees for this amazing turnout. Um, and I really want to thank you, Sam, for sharing your thoughts and really bringing some like new ideas to the table. Um, and I will wrap up my speaking. If anybody else has any final thoughts, I just want to say thank you so much. Go to ecmku.org slash donate to help support programming like this. And also just click around on the website to see if there's any other programming that you'd like to get involved with. Um, and with that, if anybody has any final thoughts, I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful evening, everyone.